So today's topic is kind of an agenda. We have an hour here today, a little less than an hour now. Um, we're going to start off kind of talking about what this area of research, when we talk about entrepreneurial action and religion, what does that mean? What are the boundaries of that? Then we'll go into how this is kind of processing and disentangle the decision from the action. And then we'll spend most of the time talking about future research areas and implications for this. Um, since a lot of the panelists, when we original, originally were talking about this session, um, most of our discussion revolved around this future research area. So we felt like given the nature of this conference and the way it's gone in the last two years, that this would be probably a more fruit, fruitful discussion moving forward. Um, so that'll be the majority of our discussion today. So we're going to start with the area of research and boundaries. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And we have Lol pinned. Why will this not go away? Okay. And you get to kick us off. Um, so, well, actually, you know what? I'm going to unpin you because you're on the next part. So I want to open this to our full panel, all five of you. Um, so when we talk about entrepreneurial action and religion and this intersection, what do you all feel we're actually talking about? Like, what is that intersection? What, what does that research look like at this point? <laughs> Any of my panelists? Brick hit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Are we talking about, okay, so one of the discussions we had earlier was whether or not entrepreneurial action and religion, is it an area? Is it a topic? Is it a field? I mean, why don't we start there and kind of talk about what we think there? Yeah, and, and I guess that question reminds me of the, the earlier years of entrepreneurship and where we were uh grappling for uh <laughs> existence and and what was going on and were we just borrowing concepts from from other fields and applying them uh, sort of thing and i um you know and there were people who were saying hey you don't have uh, a good definition of entrepreneurship so how can we develop as a field how can you go forward um and i think some of the main turning points for for entrepreneurship as a, as a whole, maybe provide some lessons for for this area of religion and entrepreneurship. And, and uh, it wasn't agreeing on a unified de definition that that propelled us forward. Um, it was uh, I, I would say that it was one getting beyond this the point of a feeling like we needed to just ex, uh, extend concepts from from other fields and when people in entrepreneurship started doing deeper thinking uh, and and doing good research that set boundaries around their specific research not necessarily the field as a whole um, that uh, and then there was kind of the area of of nascent entrepreneurship and and the development of opportunities and so forth that that when when it became a, a means of exchange with other di, di, uh, other uh, academic areas, people begin to realize, hey, if I want to know about the development of new organizations, where do I go? I got to go to entrepreneurship uh, and the development of new opportunities. Virtually all other fields take organizations' existence as already assumed and and uh, and go from there. So I guess um, I guess my my extended plea was we're in an area here where there's obviously a great deal of variance and ambiguity. What are we talking about when we talk about? religion, does that include spirituality or is spirituality different, et cetera, et cetera, that we've heard already today. Um, I think that the, my plea would be for us to carefully uh, de define our concepts as, as individual research teams and, uh, and then, uh, but, but also think about um, what we can, what, what's unique that we're going to be able to probe into the lens of what's going on inside 
decision makers uh, and uh, and entrepreneurship more specifically, what what is this going to open up that to this point is pretty much behind uh, closed doors or uh, behind the curtain, so to speak, that that we can bring out and uh, and if we can learn to crack that, I think then um, then then we'll gain legitimacy and uh, and go forward. So. That's a good way to kick us off. Uh, panelists, anyone else have something they think they want to add to what Lol said? Just yeah. uh, good. Yeah, please, I defer. Oh, sorry, Lou. Sorry, Lou. Yeah, um, yeah. One of the things I, I just wanted to add uh, to what Lol said there, and you know, I guess it's the, one of the big themes for this whole, you know, for the Life Conference and, and initiative is the big question of, you know, what is it? about religion or, or, or ideas or concepts within religions broadly that fundamentally you know changes or adapts the ways entrepreneurs go about <laughs> thinking which is our sort of focus and, and doing things and one of the things for me personally that sort of got me fascinated in the last sort of year or so is this sort of distinction between and I've had conversations with with Brett about this a lot of religious entrepreneurship so the focus may be empirically on is there something that religious entrepreneurs as a subject matter do differently that's interesting versus uh, which is what we're trying to get at more broadly uh, David and Lowell and I in a, in, a, in a paper we're working on at the moment is there something we can learn I say we being everybody irrespective of one's personal faith or spirituality is there something we can draw from sort of religious ideas um, that helps us understand, in our case, how how entrepreneurs navigate the pro, you know, the rough and tumble of of starting a new company? So, uh, you know, I'll talk a little bit later about uncertainty in in particular, but um, but yeah, I in my mind at least, there's two sort of camps here. There's the phenomena of religious entrepreneurs, and then there's more abstractly. Is the, are there ideas from particular religions or denominations within religions that is interesting more broadly? Could be practically useful for entrepreneurs to think, huh, there's an idea within Christianity maybe that helps me grapple with the uncertainty about certain things, or maybe there's an idea within Islam or, or Judaism, et cetera. So um, yeah, just wanted to share that, <laughs> get us talking. It's a good point. Bill, do you, you have your hand raised. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll lower it now. Um, uh, I, I'm going to actually, I'm going to put some in the chat box and then I'll actually put the article in as well. So uh, I want to make a plug for this article. My my avocation kind of, you know, as an amateur in entrepreneurship is really the love of looking at what entrepreneurs do and whether that makes any difference or not. And so I've been involved now for about 10 years with the Entrepreneurship as Practice Group, which is primarily out of Europe. It's looking at, the specifics in particular situations of how entrepreneurs act in certain ways to get things done. And so uh, with a working group out of the Netherlands, uh, basically uh, the first two people were doctoral students with Domenico D'Antoni. And I've been working with Domenico now for about five years. Kind of the, they had a big project in Africa where they were looking at um, African entrepreneurs and navigating how things occurred in their situation as they tried to make things happen. And the interesting thing that came out of that, and that's why I'm here in this conference, is, is that spirituality was a big issue. That Now, in Africa, that wasn't Christianity or kind of, well, there was a part of that, but witchcraft, even in terms of Christianity, played out in an interesting way. So, But it was how, how they use spirituality to navigate through making things happen. So, you know, to, to me, it was an interesting aspect about the use of religion, but it's got me thinking, too, about how one uses their spiritual and religious beliefs as a way to take action. And, and um, I'll come back to that later. I've got a really good quote. You know, typically we think about uh, the nature of uncertainty and its relationship to providence. And if we think of providence as kind of a spiritual or religious aspect that helps us move forward, what we're kind of navigating in that role of how that works. Now, you know, some you know, some Catholics like go to go to a mass and light candles as a way to navigate their own struggles with how they're going to get things done. But certainly we found this situation in Africa 
as, uh, you know, you needed to use witchcraft if you wanted to make sure that you were going to be successful. I'll, I'll put the article in the chat box too. So that's my little point. Thanks for sharing that. And we'll come back to that too later when Bill uh, is talking about future research areas. Um, but let's, we're about a few minutes behind on time. So let's move forward to the next part of this that we talk about how, actually let's bring up loose point real quick. My suggestion is that we define our key concepts. We pay close attention to the epistemology of the area. We need to be careful to resist the urge to simply stretch concepts. It's a good point. And I think that's one we also come back to later when we talk about um, we'll talk about skills and measurements and, and what that means for researching uh, religion and faith and spirituality with entrepreneurial action. So <clears throat> we're going to kick it over to Lowell again um, to talk a little bit about how religion affects the decision. So pre-action uh, decision making. Um, Lowell, why do you think we need to understand religion's influence on decision before understanding the impact it has on action. You are muted too, by the way. Thank you. <clears throat> one of the uh, one of the things that that challenges me anyway in listening to our our discussions across the conference and and in general in the area is uh, I just think we have to really uh, buckle down and and uh, start being able to to um, <laughs> set some boundaries, define some areas, uh, mark uh, mark some territory, so to speak. So, does religion affect um, de entrepreneurial decision making? Uh, you know, I can I, I, part of me wants to respond. Yeah, of course it does. Um, uh, how can it not if it is a, a factor? But but another part of me says, yeah, wait, uh, hold the uh, hold the phone here a little here. It that it depends, uh, and um, I think we probably all of us <laughs> in the room here uh, have have seen such wide variance in expressions of of faith and religion and. Um, in the in the field of entrepreneurship, and you know, it, it goes all the way from from people. Yeah, this is what I grew up with, and I'm extending uh, basically what I grew up with um, to um, to yeah. I you know I I attend services uh, once a week, and uh, you know I make some great contact with some other entrepreneurs, budding entrepreneurs there, uh, or, and build my network <laughs> there, uh, to, uh, to others who are, are much more serious about it. And it's, you know, on, in my own mind, I, um, I, I, I kind of, in my mind, have this, this pyramid model with three tiers, um, uh, that the, uh, that the first, first tier, the bottom tier, is really minimal, uh, uh, how can I say, impact or minimal uh, personal influence. Uh, maybe it's an extension of, of what, what they've grown up with. Maybe it's, you know, yeah, this is a, a cultural thing or a family thing that we, uh, that we go to services and, uh, and are involved in, yeah, I wanna be, you know, wanna be a good person sort of thing. And at some point, though, I find I go to the second tier, and, and that that people who take on a, a um, can I say a growing seriousness uh, about their faith want to say, you know, wait a minute, this dichotomy, <laughs> the first, the basic level is is often largely dichotomous. You know, here's my faith area, here's my here's my work area, here's my entrepreneurship. I think the second area, uh, and ultimately, uh, as people grow, that invariably they want to say, wait a minute, if this is really real, this needs to go, my faith needs to go beyond uh, collective services. Um, and uh, and so, one, you know, maybe I need to work at, you know, I really need to be more ethical in my decision-making uh, in starting my venture. 
uh, I, I really do want to treat people well, uh, my employees or prospective customers or whoever. I really, I really want to, uh, to do that because it's because it's the right thing to do. Um, and then I think there's the 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 crown of the of the pyramid, so to speak, where uh, I'll import the word uh, wholeness that Ken talked about earlier today. Uh, you know where where it becomes much more seamless, the, the di distinction between faith and what's going on in the workplace. And, and that I think it, for some significant uh, group of the 80% <laughs> of our world who claim religion, uh, that it it's becomes very, very important for them. And, or maybe not just important for them, impactful for them. It's a out, natural outgrowth of who they are as individuals that uh, to conduct the business in a way that's consistent with their faith and their and their work uh, actually feeds their faith. Um, that if that if uh, I mean for for entrepreneurship to uh, to go forward for developing a venture or whatever, learning is obvious. I think we would all agree that learning is a critical part of that. And I think from a uh, that extends into the faith area for people who are are uh, practicing and are are going forward. The the entrepreneurial venture is pushing them forward to uh, to learn new things. It invariably overlaps with the uh, with the spiritual. So so that's kind of my foundational thinking at this point about uh, about how religion potentially impacts or will it impact decision-making? Does it impact the decision-making of entrepreneurs? Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, or for some, yeah, definitely. I think for those at the, at the top of the pyramid, it's, it's deeply intertwined. Uh, it's integral to, uh, that it's inseparable. Um, whereas those at the bottom of the pyramid, it's, it's more dichotomous and I'm not so sure that the impact is uh, is there so much so 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 that's kind of my my initial rubric for um, answering that the question about religion affecting uh, decision making of entrepreneurs and uh, and how research could potentially go forward. I think it's I think instead of clustering all those together and say all right does does religion affect entrepreneurship? And we go out and collect the data and are you, are you religious and and, uh, and so forth. And, you know, it'd be kind of like amazing if we find any result. maybe we do. Uh, but I think there's, the, in my mind, the tears would be, uh, would, would shed a whole lot more light on that question. That's great. Well, thank you for that. And, and for our audience members, if you all have questions for any of our panelists, you're welcome to put them in the chat or raise your hand or unmute. At any point of this, we want it to be um, as discussion based as we can make it. So we're going to kick it over to Rob next. I'm switching the pin now. You're pinned. Um, so you're going to help us take it from what Lowell's talking about with decision making to the actual action piece of this. So can you can you shed some light on it? What how you think we can learn from looking at religion and faith and its influence on entrepreneurial action? Sure. So um, I guess the sort of middle piece between religious ideas and, and entrepreneurial action for us and our discussions on it over the last sort of year or so has been uncertainty. Right. And we all know, <laughs> go to any entrepreneurship conference, uncertainty is a big deal. And in particular, how entrepreneurs, you know, accept a certain degree of uncertainty practically in, in starting companies and, and, and doing various sort of uh, risky things uh, embedded within that um and and most importantly how they kind of psychologically navigate you know an inherently an uncertain sort of path so i guess so our thinking has been implicit within a lot of the discussion on that uh, uncertainty and, and and risk as well um is it sort of this probabilistic kind of assumption that underpins that right and uh, the, uh I don't know whether it's sort of a, the trajectory of how our field evolved from sort of strategy and then economics underpinning that. But there's this sort of these ideas underpinning this, that anything that's based on religion or spirituality is sort of over here somewhere. And we sort of talked about how this sort of false dichotomy between science and religion and how it's sort of presented 
more broadly in uh, in our sort of intellectual discussions generally um kind of frames our thinking on on how entrepreneurs navigate risk and uncertainty right so our big thing uh it has been trying to understand when we break up uncertainty into its different c- components so we sort of discussed in it sort of extended a, a bradley and dretchler's paper on modal uncertainty so uncertainty about what is possible or what could be the case uh, empirical uncertainty so uncertainty about what is the case or has it been or, or would it be the case and then normative uncertainty which is which they define as what is desirable or what should be the case so there's sort of a value judgment element there so we've sort of played around with thinking about how when we draw from a different kind of bucket of knowledge if you like and a different sort of track <laughs> of thought <laughs> over the millennia rather than just looking at sort of the, the the usual realm of sort of science probabilistic reasons underpinning uncertainty what can we learn <laughs> and our big sort of thing we sort of develop these various uh decision tools from drawing from different religions but is to more broadly try and understand are there ideas within various religious uh, religions and, and religious traditions that really speak to how a person navigates or handles or thinks about those different parts of uncertainty and the short answer is yes we think they do and we think as a result irrespective of whether you detest religion and you don't want to be anywhere you know involved with re- religious entrepreneurship or religion and entrepreneurship you know we think that it we're trying to introduce a sort of a a new lens on on or integrate a new stream of literature that's sort of unorthodox that we don't think fits together, which is religious ideas and how entrepreneurs navigate and certain. Anyway, I've been waffling. I tend to do that when it's silent. So we appreciate, or I appreciate thoughts, questions, and, and a discussion. Thank you. So Rob, there is a question in the chat and you, I'm, we may need to clarify this. Um, how, about the role of entrepreneurs' understanding of religious values and norms. I'm assuming that's their understanding of the religious values and norms and how that influences their actions. Mm-hmm. But if not, I'm going to butcher your name. Wa Wa you? If you want to clarify it too, you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, my question is how about talking about the religious values or religious belief influencing to the entrepreneurial action, but. We miss about uh, we believe in uh, religion probably, but how about the understanding about the religious norms itself? Sometimes uh, we we claim that I'm a Muslim, I'm a Christian, but how about the understanding about the Islam itself, the Christian itself? It probably would influence the entrepreneurial action itself. I mean, it would uh, provide different, uh, yeah, different different view of, of different, yeah, different uh, result to the influence of the religious belief. Uh, I mean, uh, people, entrepreneurs who have good religious understanding, belief in religions, it would, uh, you know, influence the entrepreneurial action itself or influence the entrepreneurial decision. Uh, how about uh, the uh, my question is the 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 understanding of the religious values or norms itself. Thank you. Oh, that's a that's a tough one. Um, thanks for the for the comments. I appreciate it. So you're asking, you know, people's knowledge, entre- an entrepreneur's knowledge of their own religious kind of framework and and theology, I guess, and how that. In- I mean, that, that's interesting. And I, I don't have an immediate answer to that. And I, I think my answer is more, we're, uh, recently we've tried to more broadly draw from, I guess, more abstractly. So not necessarily whether an individual entrepreneur knows or doesn't know all these kind of facts, if you like, about religion and religious traditions, but more abstractly, you know, if someone was to really embrace this particular principle, how would this practically help them? So to give you, to be a bit more concrete, so and we try to sort of be eclectic in terms of how we sort of uh, uh, review the sort of religious literature and thinking on this. But intuitive judgment, for example, is one thing that we sort of uh, uh, fleshed out as really important for, for entrepreneurs. And 
all religious traditions speak to elements of this in many ways, but you know, in particular, the the Taoist concept um, of, of of intuitive judgment, we argue, you know, it sort of uh, influences um, this this ability to handle paradoxes, for example, right? So, in the face of just people constantly putting down your ideas, which we can relate to as academics as well, by the way, um, you have to have there's that sort of gut instinct of being comfortable. Uh, handling these, these these sort of paradoxes and sort of going trusting your gut and being able to overcome that element of uncertainty and redemptive choice ideas of redemption and how that influences uh, ethical uh, uncertainty as well may be relevant to sort of previous discussion on social entrepreneurship perhaps um, so yeah more bro- I guess I don't have an immediate answer to specific entrepreneurs do they need to know if you like the content of the religion but more if you were to embrace and really study a particular concept within one religion, um, how does that influence that uncertainty? I thought that was a really good answer for being put on the spot, Rob. Riffin, I enjoy this. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, Robbie, you bring up a good point that I'm going to delay until later on because Bill has a whole section on basically exactly what you're talking about, but I think it's really valuable. So just Stay tuned. Um, Any more questions on the decision-making or action piece of what we're already studying and why this is important before we kick it over to future research? Okay, then we're gonna kick it to Lou. Now you're pinned, Lou. I think the pinning part of this might be my, the most fun part of this whole panel for me. (laughs) Just get to move you guys around. Going back to your sorority days. Well, I wasn't in a sorority, but you know, that's okay. This is my chance to live that part of my life I never did. Um, So we're going to talk about future research areas. And for Lou, we're going to focus yours on, on groups and how you think religion affects different groups and their actions differently. Okay. Thank you. You know, my participation in this came about as a somewhat accidental uh, data gathering experience that happened that that we're in right now. And we're doing a deep study on the black owned business ecosystem in Alabama that's being funded by one of our one of our agencies. And as part of that, the one of the one of the uh, premises we were using to gather the data without our asking gathered religiosity data. And when we started looking at that, we started understanding that there were differences between ethnic groups and whether they were rural versus urban, how important religion and religiosity was to their life and how much it could influence potential outcomes. Now, just for fun, you know, I'll tell you also that the data we were gathering, we were using the GEM methodology. So we have the GEM intentions to start as well as are you starting, what are you doing along, along with that data. And I think as we go forward, we need to be very careful of thinking not just about a broad concept of religion and how it, and how it works in terms of entrepreneurship, but how contextual factors such as race, ethnicity, gender, how, how all those things would, would apply. And we had to be willing to look at some of the uncomfortable questions. For example, one of the things that we're looking at at the urging of one of the study participants that we that we had talked to did it. We're doing some oh, we were doing some quality of data gathering, and she expressed the concern that whereas one things I one thing one of the things I study is maladaptive traits and neurodiversity and how it leads to entrepreneurial action. She expressed the fact that in the African-American community, that may not be the same because there's a significant stigma associated with neurodiversity. And so therefore they may actually have less support for those types of things in that space. And i had never considered that before. And that was just a wow moment for me. And so I wonder as well, when you think about how firms, how they respond to uncertainty, the importance of religiosity to your life, right? What Lowe was talking about in, in, in debt in, uh, and how in depth that is. I think as you think about different groups, not just country to country, which I think is a great aspect of religion to religion, but even within those religions, 
how is it how is it going to play out? And I think there are some things such as you know uh, collectivism that are, that are going to matter, and some things that are such as the importance of not just religion but the church to your social life. When we were we we're, were having trouble doing some follow up studies uh, in the rural Alabama, especially among the African American community. And we went to one of our experts in economic development in our economic area, our Seber area. And he said, you're never gonna get, you're never gonna get African Americans in the rural areas to respond unless you go to the churches, which are the center of their social life and which they deem as the, which they deem as the you know, uh, institutional purveyors of honesty and truth. If you get, if you get them to agree, then, then people will fault your surveys. If they don't, you won't. That's the only way you're going to be able to do it. And so I think that's also thinking about, even at that level, what the role of religion is in terms of setting up the institutions, not just on the broader level, but on a, but on a very micro level, how people interact and how they see things and what, and what, their, uh, what their role in entrepreneurship is. And just one more aspect of that was working with the student consulting group who wanted to start a micro loan project in Alabama. They're having a very hard time identifying communities that they could tie into that would be strong enough to have the have the uh, group cohesion to repay the loans and make them move. And guess what? Guess what the simple answer was? Churches. Because because at least in Alabama and in the South and the Bible Belt, in certain areas, the cohesion of the church is so strong that the social pressure is there in order to repay the loans and participate in the in, in those aspects where otherwise wouldn't be. And so as we think about the different groups and we think about comparing them, I think we need to ask questions about, about gender and about race and about morality and, 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 and those, those types of issues. And I think we can lean heavily on things that have been done in sociology in some of those spaces to bring in meaningful literature in those areas. Uh, I've been learning about the enclave effects and this idea of there's a stronger enclave effect in the area, especially if that enclave is centered around a church then you're much more likely to have a more pronounced on a more pronounced effect of the church, not just religion, but the church on individuals' lives. And of course, as we do that, I'll keep on the same horse I wrote, wrote before when I talked about EO is we've got to be very careful to maintain and grow the legitimacy of this space, which I think is important. We've got to be very careful about maintaining consistency in concepts and measurement and making sure that we are talking about the same thing and do so in a way that is cohesive as opposed to divisive. So I, I wanna, if anyone else has questions, feel free to chime in. Um, but Lou, I wanted to ask you, since you've been working with these um, populations that are a bit more um, sensitive, and we're, you're also talking about sensitive topics like religion. Do you have any advice for those of us who may want to collect data in these, these populations on how to basically ensure that our engagement with them is one that's not making them more marginalized or feel more marginalized? You know, that actually, that's a great question. And I've learned so much uh, the first thing I've had to learn is going in humble is the most important thing. And you go in humble, understand that you, you're not there to give them the answers. You're there to learn and ask the questions that, that, that they care about. The other, the other thing that we were told very directly by some of our constituencies um, was that, especially in the African-American population in Alabama, they thought they were one of the most over-surveyed but underserved populations in the U.S., that people wanted their data, they wanted to do two cool studies, but they never wanted to help. And they never, nobody ever followed up and told them what the results were or did things to help them. And so I think going in and realizing that if you want to have change, you've got to build trust. And then once you build the trust, only through building the trust can you, can you then actually get access to the data. And then realize as well, and this is, these are not my words, they're the words of somebody else. Um, I was told that to gather some of the data we wanted to gather, especially qualitatively, that no matter what, if I walked into certain areas, people would not share things with me. I'm telling you, unless they would taken a long time to get to know me. So any surveys I did or any qualitative data I did would truly be superficial and they, they would not open, open their eyes to me, open their hearts or, or information to me. 
So you have to realize that as well, that sometimes you can't be the right person to gather the data and you can't be the right person to do that. And you truly have to realize that you, that well, you can appreciate somebody's journey, you may never ever be able to walk in their shoes. And to think you can do that is just arrogant. And that will quickly get you, get you uh, locked out of those populations. That's great, great advice. Thank you for sharing that. Um, okay. If anyone else has questions for Lou, you're welcome to put them in the chat. We can always come back to them, but I'm going to switch it over to David, which my pinning abilities are getting a little skewed because I can't find him. Okay. I found you. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about for future research about scale and measurement of some of these concepts we're talking about. And my question for you is, do you think the current tools and measurements and scales we have um, are enough? Or do you think that they're limiting our understanding of action in entrepreneurial religion research? Yeah, that's a tough question, right? I mean, again, it, I think there's pretty wide variation in the, the specific scales tools that that we could uh, we could discuss. And of course, all of it you know, centers on on a research question that we uh, you know that we're asking. I think more broadly, action theoretic approaches are maybe to backtrack slightly, are, are probably under-theorized in a sense of really understanding what action theory itself is, is trying to get at, right? And so if we sort of think about from a, more from a meta-theoretic perspective, we have a, you know, this kind of overarching view of, of, of uh, entrepreneurial action. What do we even mean by that, right? And there's different tools and different approaches and different different ways that, uh, you know, people have addressed some facets of that, you know, of course, I just reviewed a paper recently. Um, people are applying Coleman's boat or applying different frameworks to try to even understand sequences or sections of of that. And so, you know, I, I think there's need for lots of precision, um, you know, much more precision around action theory overall to understand that. Because in the context of religion, I think we need to understand both as an antecedent condition, right? We talked about values and norms and institutional roles of religion and and how that potentially you know, influences action. And then, you know, more importantly, action, um, you know, the consequences of that action. And so if we talk about religious entrepreneurship or religious entrepreneurs uh, acting in particular ways, what are the broader consequences of that, right? And, and, uh, and so I think, you know, there's facets of those problems that, you know, from a tools-based perspective are, you know, are, uh, um, you know, still a bit challenging for us overall before we even kind of get into those those particular questions, you know, about scales or, or measurement strategies. I think, you know, specific to beliefs, let me focus on that particular one. You know, there's a lot of work now that's starting to look at experimentation strategies and entrepreneurship. And so if you guys, you know, there's the Zelber and Zanger paper, a great paper on scientific entrepreneurship, talks about Bayesian rationality and lays out the importance of beliefs. Um, you know, what do we mean by beliefs? How would we go about measuring that? And, you know, what are the particular ways that we would understand, you know, how someone's subjective preferences or beliefs about the future shape their behavior? Um, so I think there's a lot of room to shape, you know, and develop some additional work on that, right? As both from a construct perspective, but even more importantly, uh, to measure that. You know, Rob talked about some of our research and we think about um, you know, non-probabilistic tools and, you know, the broader body of research on that talks about non-probabilistic tools and there's as this sort of truth preserving function, right? So they're decision tools that may not rely on probability theory or statistical analysis, but they're still supposed to preserve truth, right? And so we should be able to measure potential positive consequences of that. But to do that, we've got to be able to understand what beliefs really mean. And I really like you know, Alex and Jess work on imaginativeness, you know, and the scales that were developed there. And I think there's room for kind of, you know, correlate approaches that would take that as an analog and say, okay, now let's really try to understand what we mean by beliefs, you know, these, these views, expectations of the future, um, you, know, uh, um, you know, some knowledge that people, people have. Um, so I, I think, you know, again, I see it as more, uh, um, you know, not to be critical of specific tools, but I, I do think that there's a need for a lot more precision, um, you know, to to be able to get to that because, you know, we infer action a lot, right? We look at, you know, maybe, you know, some antecedent condition, and we look at, you know, um, assuming there's some action process sequence 
uh, that produced uh, or is in response to that, and we can measure some kind of consequences of that. But we're inferring an awful lot of things um, that are, you know, actually happening underneath that. And you know, I think there's you know, plenty of room for more precision, um, uh, you know, on that. So beliefs is one in particular I think is really important for us to do that quantifying, getting down to understanding. And of course, I'm a uh, you know, huge advocate of mixed methodologies. And I think, you know, triangulating that with um, multiple different approaches, different tools uh, to help us unpack research questions that, you know, beliefs are an important uh, part of, I think is essential as we go forward. So again, if anyone has questions, feel free to hop in. Um, in the meantime, David, do you do you think that there are any sort of biases that our current measures include like social de desirability, social influence, locus of control that we need to account for more moving forward to ensure that our measures that we are currently already using don't have these biases reflected in our results and our findings so far? Yeah, that's a... It's a challenging question, I think, in particular in, in entrepreneurship, you know, as it ties into religion, you know, I think there's different views people have, you know, about obviously, you know, rational choice, rational thought versus religiously inspired belief and, and thinking. And, you know, and I mean, implicitly, I think there's a lot of work that goes back and, you know, you got your, you know, Weber had his four categories and the one that's been pretty much completely ignored is the traditional category. And, and to some degree, there's plenty of interpretation that looks at it in a pejorative light, you know, that the other three were, you know, more modern types of rationality. And you have the, you know, a, a, a specific, um, you know, traditional thinking, traditional logic, traditional views, um, you know, as, as being problematic. And so as we develop, you know, thinking and scales and ways to measure and, and research questions, Around that, if there's an implicit assumption that people make that religious values are somehow inherently problematic, you know, they're built on superstition or, you know, mystical reasoning and, and somehow they're, uh, um, you know, uh, not well suited to making, quote unquote, uh, effective or good decisions. Um, I think that could certainly show up in lots of different places. Um, you know, I think there are lots of measures that are really important, you know, on a, on a slightly different front to entrepreneurship, things like self-efficacy. You know, building on theories of, of agency and agentic choice, agentic action that I think are, are important. But to your point about locus of control or to some extent of beliefs even about agency, I know, you know some of the research that I've been reviewing and work that we're, we're working on, I think we, you know, we've got to be clear, especially on the religious side, on this transcendence versus eminence problem, right? And so to me, religion provides a lot of variation to to look at these differences because there's different theories of agency that you know different religious systems have have developed all of them influence organizing choices behaviors um, that people make and so i think it's important for us to scrutinize what we believe is you know is, is fundamentally the role of, of agency and agentic choice agentic action if you will um, you know whether or not it's you know specifically tied to locus of control or self-efficacy you know, obviously always depends on the, on the research question, you know, but I, I mean, I find some inspiration what Lou is saying, you know, again, when he's, he's in, in these populations, how important, you know, um, religion and the religious practices, but the religious community itself, right, is, is uh, kind of the, the community side of this and how much that infuses actions people take, um, you know, so certainly understanding that depending on whatever we're measuring, right, whatever a research question is, I think is, is uh, critically important. That's great, thank you. We have um, a question in the chat from David. Um, building on the discussion we've been having, the li level of religiosity or spiritual spirituality could be dynamic even within a person, which could complicate measurement. What are your thoughts on addressing that? Yeah, this is a really interesting question because, uh, you know, and David, if I can, you have an amazing first name. So let me just first compliment you on your, uh, on your first name here. Um, you know, so uh, we'll, we'll stick with our team, David, here. Um, you know, I think there are, you know, there are certainly like life course, life cycle kind of questions that people would go through. But one of the things I think would might be interesting to kind of reframe your question slightly, because I do think it's important, 
but there's also different ways that people enact religion, right? And if you sort of, you think about some of the, again, this, maybe this tension between where it's, you know, there's a, a social benefit to it and, and it's, it's productive. Like there's a generative side of belief in religion or spiritual, you know, um, beliefs. Um, I think there are facets of that that are important to, to capture. There's also, you know, clearly negative repercussions, right, of, of religious belief, religious um, practices. And so, you know, to some degree, you know, people, if they get attracted very much towards this, this idea of, of um, you know, almost extreme orthodoxy, right? And so, um, you know, this, this, or this, this sort of uh, extreme activism that can emerge Right. I think you see all sorts of potentially problematic behaviors potentially that can emerge both that are consequences for that person, but consequences overall. And so, I mean, I don't think religion itself has, you know, functionally any type of clear, you know, it's not always going to produce socially or psychologically, um, you know, mental well-being, all those things or social well-being. Um, and, but it's also not going to produce the opposite. I think there are people's experiences that can shape that. And so, one of the things some of my doctoral students are working on is again thinking about this idea of emancipatory entrepreneurship, and I really love that you know the Chandra's paper and and JBV in 2017 where you know they looked at religious terrorists basically, and then social entrepreneurship as this emancipating process. And I think understanding the conditions under which religious beliefs, spiritual beliefs, are emancipating versus really creating problematic, you know, again psychological, social consequences for the person is is really important. And there's a certainly subject to process dynamics, I think, is people both encounter the world that they live in, but the social world that they live in, reinforcement from, you know, value peers, family, all of those kind of things. I don't think religion has a socially beneficial or socially destructive set of consequences, right? It doesn't fit cleanly in Bommel's sort of productive, unproductive, destructive kind of general uh, framework here. Um, but there are processes people can go through that would would lend themselves to uh, you know um, you know different outcomes. So I mean, it's again, it's a wonderful question. I think there's some fun complexity that we need to disentangle. Thank you for that. That's great. So now we're going to kick it over to Bill. Where are you on my screen? I can't even. I found you. Okay, awesome. So we're going to uh, talk about. <clears throat> differences that different religions could play in what we understand. And this comes back to, um, I think it was Ravi's point earlier. Yes. Um, but do you think that the majority of our research, and even Brett was talking a little bit about this earlier with the SBE special issue, there's a huge focus on Christianity when we talk about faith and there are how many other religions that have been largely ignored so far in our understanding do you think that we need to shift this focus in order to understand the role of faith and religiosity um, in entrepreneurial action? I, you know, I think this is a question broadly for a lot of different aspects of where entrepreneur, entrepreneurship is going. You know, part of our our focus primarily in the journals has been research on on North American and European firms and entrepreneurs. So we have spent less time looking at entrepreneurs in Asia, Latin America, and Africa. So I think that's a big challenge because certainly Christianity is a kind of a majority population issue in North America, but it's not in other, it's certainly not in Africa, and it's certainly not in Asia. So if we're more interested in what's happening around the world, um, then I, I think we need to consider that uh, other religious perspectives are going to play a larger role in in where things are going so yeah no i i uh i want to add a few other things so yeah i think that's a big issue that once we take a larger view and think about what's happening in the rest of the world what's happening in the middle east then then we need to realize we we tend to have a north american bias about the nature of firms and entrepreneurs and we have a bias about the nature of kind of religious practices so when we get to other countries it's simply not going to hold up um but i want to kind of talk about a couple of other things because i know we're running out of time too about where we're going and that's as 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 this issue gets played out in the journals i want everyone to recognize that as you submit journal articles that have a focus on religion and entrepreneurship, 
You need to help guide the editors and reviewers about where you're going and what your conversation's about. If I've had any problem in navigating this process in organization studies is every editor and reviewer has their own view about the nature of spirituality and where they want to go. And so, you know, we spent a lot of time, basically three revisions on a dialogue about the nature of spirituality and how that related to, to entrepreneurship. So, you know, there is a lot of literature on spirituality and religion in relationship to management and where that goes. So think about kind of what what your literature stream is that's informing where you're going to take it and how you're going to use that to deal with your editors and reviewers. And also when you write to editors, I think you need to think about here's kind of the perspectives I'm taking so that there's some fairness. You know, as Lowell indicated at the beginning, certainly the challenge with entrepreneurship at the beginning of the field was lots of people had different views of what entrepreneurship was. And, you know, you really had to at the beginning inform your reviewers and editors about your definition and where you were going. Once that got accepted, things were much easier to get published. So, um, uh, and then one other thing too, you know, in terms of action, my my gold standard ideally is, um, you know, and I think this was brought up by, by Lou and David as well. You know, if you're in the field, the gold standard really is ethnography. If you can be an anthropologist, really live in the field with your participants, I think then you can really find out about the power of religion. The witchcraft study, uh, uh, the two doctoral students were in the field for two years. And that's how they really got to experience the nature of how witchcraft and really work through these entrepreneurs in terms of how they dealt with their situations. So it wasn't something where they could just go in and ask for a survey and get a bunch of data. It was living in the field for two years so they could really get an experience of how in the day-to-day -day spiritual practices really played out in these entrepreneurs' lives. So, you know, that's ideal. But I can also say there's lots of survey data out there. The government actually collects a lot of information on some of these things that can be used longitudinally across time. So, uh, and I know I'm running out of time for one other thing. I think the interesting thing that I'm seeing here is, is that religion becomes important when you simply ask the question. And my analogy to that is the GEM research studies, which Lou talked about, Jim had never asked in the 20 years that they'd been doing it about the nature of family and were families important in entrepreneurial activity. Last year, we asked that question, are families important? And lo and behold, in, in over 80% of all startups, there's a family component. And I would say, if you ask about religion and spirituality, you're going to get an answer that it's really important. And I think the surprise for most research is no one's asked it. So, you know, I think that's an important aspect of the variable. And I think, Lou, you talked about the fact that once you talk about race, ethnicity, gender, socio and economic aspects, why not add religion to where you're going and to see where that plays out? And I think it will be important. And, and I'm going to leave you with one last thing. I'm going to put one more thing in the chat box. Um, and that's, you know, it, you could almost find spirituality and religion in, in a many things if you begin to look for it. This is my favorite quote in entrepreneurship. I use it in all my classes. And the core of this piece is providence. Providence moves people forward. No matter what you do, that's a part of where our realities are. And you can see that visibly in almost all entrepreneurial action, but we don't want it, we don't necessarily pay attention to it. So sorry, sorry for the ramble. Thanks. I can see we're almost going to end. No, I thought that was great. And I like this quote. It was really, it was a great quote to add. Um, before we close out, since Amanda's saying we have five minutes left, um, does anyone have, <laughs> have any more questions for our panelists um, that you'd like to talk about? Ravi, you can see uh, where we brought up kind of what you were talking about with the Islamic and Sharia law on loans and um, dividends. And it's the same for we, when we were talking as a group with the panel. Um, a few weeks ago, we were also talking about Protestant work ethics and um, Muslim finance and how all of these pieces of different religions play a role in startup activities. But we don't, if we spend too much time focusing on just Christianity, we're largely ignoring the role that these other religious um, beliefs play in entrepreneurial action as well. 
So any other questions, comments that we want to discuss before we have to leave the room? I'll add one other piece to that. I, yeah. I, I've had, it's almost been a 10 year project and it's been stalled in many ways, but I've got a project called Translating Entrepreneurship where I've asked uh, scholars from different countries to talk and define what entrepreneurship is using their cultural values and language. And it, once we begin to look at culture, we find that that the thinking about entrepreneurship in most countries has nothing to do with how Nor North Americans think about it. Nothing to do with it. So I kind of want to add that because when we're talking about Shira law and the Mideast, you know, the way the way Muslim entrepreneurship is thought about is often very different. But I can tell you, Germans think about entrepreneurship in a radically different way compared to how uh, North Americans talk about it. We don't talk about the middle stat in North America, but it's a crucial part of what entrepreneurship is in Germany. So if there's a cultural issue we're not we're not paying attention to. Yeah, Sorry. that's a great point of uh, making sure that you're accounting for different contexts and backgrounds when you're doing your research, especially when it comes to religion.